For many, Tim Burton's Batman and Batman Returns will never be topped, and although we've been re-watching and talking about these iconic films for over three decades now, it's impossible to know every single secret about them. With that in mind, I've joined forces with Jules Gill to present What Culture's 50 Things You Didn't Know About Tim Burton's Batman. Holy awesome sponsor time, Batman! Just before we continue with the list, I want to talk to you about this video sponsor, Fan Home, because they have a new collection coming up, and who oh boy, if you're into your Batman as much as I am, then you're gonna want to keep watching. Fan Home is currently offering the chance for you to build your own Batmobile modeled on the iconic version seen in the Adam West and Burt Ward fronted Batman TV series from the 1960s. It's one of my favorite ever Batmobiles, and yeah, the model here looks great. Standing at just over 71 centimeters in length, Van Hoon's replica Batmobile packs a lot in the detail department, with the team having carefully studied the show to give you a properly accurate model. The Batmobile includes a detailed engine block, working lights, and loads of little references to the many gadgets West Batman deployed on the show. Each week, you'll be given different parts of the model to assemble, with detailed, easy-to-follow instructions helping you ensure you don't leave the dynamic duo stranded the next time they're chasing after the Joker. For more on Fan Home's 1960s Batmobile, be sure to check out the link in the video description. Another cool little bonus? Fan Home customers who opt for the Batmobile subscription will also get a bunch of snazzy gifts, including three posters with art inspired by the 1960s Batman show, a cap and mug with that iconic red Batmobile logo on it, a license plate, and a t-shirt. Those who subscribe via PayPal will also get an extra free gift. Thanks once again to Fan Home for sponsoring this video, and now, back to the list. Warner Brothers used Robin Williams as bait to secure Jack Nicholson. Though it's practically impossible to imagine anyone but Jack Nicholson embodying Tim Burton's Joker, Warner Brothers considered a number of other performers for the part, such as Willem Dafoe, Tim Curry, David Bowie, Robert De Niro, and even Jeff Goldblum. When the studio eventually offered the Joker to Nicholson, he wasn't quite convinced by the project, and so Warner reached out to Robin Williams, who accepted the role. However, it turns out that they were only using Williams to persuade Jack to take the role, which he obviously Obviously did. Understandably, Williams was infuriated at being used in such a fashion and refused to work with Warner Brothers again until they apologized. Williams did get a kind of revenge a few years later though, as when he was offered the part of the Riddler in Batman Forever, he duly turned it down. It was shot in just three months. Burton's Batman started principal photography on October 17, 1988, and wrapped on January 12, 1989, amounting to slightly less than three months of shooting, which is extraordinarily fast for a production of this scale, especially factoring in the Christmas break. Compare it to every other subsequent Batman movie, and it seems even more miraculous. Batman and Robin was four and a half months, Batman Returns and Batman Forever were about five and a half months, Batman Begins and The Dark Knight Rises was six and a half months, and The Dark Knight almost seven months. Given that Batman 89 set the mold and had no cinematic predecessor to draw inspiration from, it's all the more impressive that Burton shot such great material in such a compressed time frame. 50,000 fans wrote protest letters after Michael Keaton's casting. It's not much of a secret that the casting of Michael Keaton as Bruce Wayne and Batman was a highly controversial thing at the time, given that the actor was better known for his comedy roles and his more slender frame didn't fit the bulkier build that most fans expected. Of course, Keaton proved all his critics wrong, but what you might not know is just how much vitriol fans directed towards Warner Brothers for the casting. The studio ended up receiving a staggering 50,000 complaint letters. I mean, that is crazy, Right. I know that people complain a lot about comic movies and castings today, but these were physical letters. That's actual effort. Michael Jackson almost worked on the soundtrack. Though Prince ended up contributing to the Batman soundtrack, the producers originally extended the offer to none other than Michael Jackson. Unfortunately, Jackson had to turn the offer down due to being on tour at the time, and Prince did us right with his tracks, but it's easy to see how MJ's music could have fit in the tone of Batman. Warner Brothers rushed out a terrible teaser trailer. As a wave of negative PR surrounded the film, Warner Brothers decided to cobble together a trailer to quell fans' fears, and in recent years that trailer found its way online. Needless to say, the nonsensical editing choices, semi-random array of footage, and utter lack of music indicate just how much of a rush job this was. Is there a six-foot bat in Gotham City? However, it ultimately seemed to do the job, and Batman, of course, went on to become a major box office smash. 
Mel Gibson was the first choice for Batman. Back when Superman director Richard Donner was being approached to direct, he fancied his Lethal Weapon star Mel Gibson for the role of Batman. And even once Donner moved on from the project, Warner Brothers kept coming back to Gibson as their first choice. And though the part was eventually offered to Gibson, he was ultimately forced to turn it down, as shooting dates conflicted with those of Lethal Weapon 2, which ironically ended up being directed by Donner. It sold roughly 10 million more tickets than The Dark Knight Rises. With the massively increased popularity of comic book movies nowadays, this statistic might seem improbable, but indeed the 1989 Batman was such a phenomenon with general audiences that it ultimately ended up selling 10 million more tickets than even Christopher Nolan's hugely awaited The Dark Knight Rises. Though inflation of course means that Nolan's movie grossed far more than Burton's in terms of pure ticket sales, Batman 89 sold 62.9 million, while the near end of its run The Dark Knight Rises had cracked only 50 million. Adam West wanted to play Batman at 60 years of age. The late Adam West will forever be beloved by Batman fans for his campy rendition of The Dark Knight in the 1960s TV show and movie. Yet West admitted following the release of Burton's film that he was disappointed not to be asked to reprise the iconic role. I'm, I'm sorry, what? You were nearly dust, my friend, and you're annoyed you didn't get a call? Oh well, it turns out that Burton did plan to use him in the role of Thomas Wayne and have his death be symbolic. Well, that actually does sound pretty good, however, this was scrapped and West was written out. Robin was almost in the movie, and Ben Affleck and Matt Damon auditioned for it. Earlier versions of Batman featured the presence of Dick Grayson, aka Robin, who would be introduced as part of his family circus troupe, the Flying Graysons. The Joker would kill Grayson's parents during a trapeze performance, and he would don the iconic Robin costume by the end of the movie, which is pretty much beat for beat what happens in Batman Forever. However, the role of Robin was as much up in the air as his parents, before they hit the ground, because Keith Sutherland, Michael J. Fox, and Eddie Murphy were all considered for the part at various stages, alongside Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, who two both auditioned. Thankfully, Warner Brothers charitably included a storyboard rendition of the sequence on the Batman DVD, with none other than Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill even lending their voices to become the Batman and the Joker respectively. Roger Ebert gave it the same review score as Batman and Robin. As wonderful a film critic as Roger was, he didn't always hit his mark, as evidenced by him awarding Burton's movie a mere two out of four stars. Though he praised the film's technical craft, he ultimately called it a depressing experience. What's more startling is that he ended up giving the exact same review score to 1997's appalling Batman and Robin, which he felt was of similar level of quality to the previous three Batman films, calling it wonderful to look at, but with nothing authentic at its core. We love you, mate, but you were very, very off base here. The film was constantly rewritten during shooting. As before mentioned, Batman's three months of shooting were pretty intense. However, some of the scenes were being written mere hours before they were shot. That climactic cathedral sequence? That wasn't even in the script, and Jack Nicholson had to ask Burton what was going to happen, and he got the response, I'm not too quite sure myself. Major changes to the third act also came late in the day after Kim Basinger convinced Burton and others that Vicky Vale should be part of the climax. As such, it's quite remarkable that the final movie feels coherent at all. Jack Nicholson made $60 million from playing the Joker. Jack Nicholson was paid only, in big quotation marks there, $6 million to play the Joker in the movie, but he smartly wrangled himself a back-end participation on the film's profits, and after it grossed more than $400 million worldwide, his pay pack had ultimately settled at a tidy $60 million. In 1989, this was a record for the most money that any actor had been paid for a single performance, and it unsurprisingly remains the fattest payday of the legendary actor's career. Ivan Reitman was originally attached to direct. The first draft of Batman was actually written back in 1980 by Tom Mankiewicz, who was fresh off the success of co-writing Richard Donner's Superman. This version of the film was much lighter in tone than what Burton's turned out to be, and Warner Brothers originally offered the directing gig to Ghostbusters' Ivan Reitman, who was going to make this into a flat-out comedy, even going so far as to lead to rumours that he was going to cast Bill Murray as Batman. Now, Murray denies ever being offered this, but can you imagine if that went ahead? Jeez. The bat suit made Michael Keaton deaf. It's not much of a secret that Michael Keaton's bat suit was a major pain in the ass for the actor, with his limited range of mobility forcing him to move his entire body simply in order to turn his head. The Dark Knight film even makes a rather hilarious crack about this later on. You want to be able to turn your head. 
A sure way of backing out of the driveway easier. But the tightness of the suit's cowl also severely limited Keaton's hearing to the point of near deafness while in the suit, which exacerbated Keaton's already pronounced claustrophobia. However, Keaton ultimately found that the sensory deprivation and general discomfort made it easier for him to get into character. He said, It made me go inward, and that's how I wanted the character to be anyway, to be withdrawn. Audiences complained that the theatrical release was too dark. Now, to be clear, audiences weren't complaining that Tim Burton's gonzo vision of Batman was too grim and gnarly, but that the picture was literally too dark to fully see what was going on. As a result, when Batman hit home video, Warner Brothers decided to head back to the editing room and tint the movie's color timing a few steps lighter, ensuring that the same issues wouldn't repeat and potentially damage video sales. Kind of like what we did with Your Mum, but instead of that, we just tried to remove the donkey. Couldn't happen, though. It was a sad day for all. And also, that's my weird one per list. Ray Liotta turned down three roles in the movie for Goodfellas. Imagine being liked so much by a director that they offer you not one role, not two roles, not even four roles, because, I mean, come on, that's insane, but three roles. That's exactly what happened to Ray Liotta, who was offered the roles of Batman, the Joker, and Harvey Dent. Yet he turned down all because he thought that the film would come off as silly, and he didn't even meet Burton to discuss it. Liotta has since stated that he regrets not taking the meeting with the filmmaker. However, it's not all that bad because he used that time to star in Goodfellas. You know that utterly epic film that everyone should see at least once? Yeah. The Prince songs were suggested by eccentric producer John Peters. The intentionally jarring inclusion of Prince on the film's soundtrack was suggested by producer John Peters, and it's an element of the movie that Burton himself still isn't thrilled about. Peters has had a decades-long reputation for enforcing bizarre creative choices upon movies, most memorably detailed by Kevin Smith, who wrote Burton's planned Nicolas Cage starring film Superman Lives. Peters insisted that the film include a mechanical spider, amongst other things, and when that idea died, it was recycled into Will Smith's Wild Wild West. No, I'm not joking. Tim Burton called the film boring. It's utterly bizarre that anyone would call this film boring, as its shooting schedule alone would have had me tearing out what's left of my body hair. However, after rapping, Tim Burton told an interviewer, I liked parts of it, but the whole movie is mainly boring for me. It's okay, but it was more of a cultural phenomenon than a great movie. Granted, time has allowed Burton to get some much-needed emotional distance from the film, and he certainly seems much more fond of it in recent years, but still, trashing your own film? Not a good look. I'm Batman was improvised by Michael Keaton. Mere minutes into the movie, Batman utters one of the most iconic lines in the history of superhero cinema as he dangles a criminal off a roof. I'm Batman. It's a simple but brilliantly effective one-liner that's endured in pop culture for all of its 30 years, but the best thing of it all, it wasn't even in the script, and Keaton came up with it himself on the spot. The script originally called for Batman to quip, I am the Knight, referring to both the literal cover of Knight and the Dark Knight himself, but Keaton opted to change it, presumably for sake of efficiency and simplicity. Batman co-creator Bob Kane was supposed to have a cameo. Batman co-creator Bob Kane was originally supposed to make a cameo in this film, but he unexpectedly fell ill and his cameo was due to be rescheduled, but sadly this never happened. Kane was intended to cameo as a cartoonist who passes a caricature drawing of Batman to reporter Alexander Knox, but Kane ultimately doesn't appear in the scene or indeed the movie at all. Kane did reportedly end up appearing in Batman Forever, yet wasn't credited for the part, so answers on a postcard if you've managed to spot him. Sylvester Stallone credits this film with killing the conventional action movie. Beloved though Burton's movie was by the general public, reactions within Hollywood were a little more mixed, as evidenced by Sylvester Stallone's blaming it for derailing the muscle-bound action hero gravy train of the 1980s. Sly said, It was the beginning of a new era. The visuals took over. The special effects became more important than the single person. I wish I had thought of Velcro muscles myself. I didn't have to go to the gym all those years, all those hours wedded to the iron game, as we call it. Well, I think we can all agree that Sly probably should have switched to the low salt protein bars, as that was pretty catty. The Penguin appeared in the original script. The original 1980 script for the movie featured not only the Joker as an antagonist, but also the Penguin, with Warner Brothers expressing interest in casting either John Candy or Peter O'Toole in the project. I don't think you could have more polar acting opposites, really, could you? Back when Steven Spielberg briefly flirted with the idea of making the Batman movie, he liked Dustin Hoffman for the Penguin, and when Richard Donner was in talks, he fancied Joe Pesci. Of course, none of these casting picks came to fruition, and Oswald Cobblepot was slung from the movie when Burton threw out the original script. Thankfully, he made his gruesome mark in the sequel. 
Jack Nicholson had contractually limited shooting hours. By most accounts, Jack Nicholson was a bit of a diva on the set of Batman, spending most of his downtime partying into the early hours, so much so that he'd come to set hungover every day and sleep his boozing off while makeup was applied to his unconscious face. But the biggest kicker of all, Nicholson's contract specified that he would have a set number of hours off between leaving the set and arriving the next day, and that he was allowed time off to watch Los Angeles Lakers home games. I mean, the performance was spellbinding, but this information makes makes that giant smile seem a little bit more forced now, doesn't it? Two reels of footage were stolen from the set. As if Batman's generally tumultuous production wasn't enough, numerous attempts were made to leak footage and images from the movie early. One news outlet even paid a cameraman to fly over one of the sets in a helicopter with a telephoto lens, and a unit publicist was offered £10,000 to provide the first picture of Jack Nicholson as the Joker, which they refused. But the public hunger for Batman reached a fever pitch when two reels of footage containing about 20 minutes of the film were stolen and copied in the hopes of creating a bootleg causing the police to be called to set. Bruce sleeping like a bat was Michael Keaton's idea. Perhaps the weirdest single moment in the entire movie involves Bruce Wayne's peculiar sleeping habits. In one scene, he's witnessed hanging upside down of what appears to be a piece of gym equipment, swinging back and forth with his hands folded, not unlike a bat. And while you'd be forgiven for assuming the idea belonged entirely to Tim Burton, it was actually another of Michael Keaton's contributions to the film. While it might seem really strange and funny even, Keaton liked the idea so much because it made Bruce seem off in some way. The fact that it was met with laughter in the cinemas probably shows that audiences were divided on the matter. Michelle Pfeiffer almost played Vicki Vale. Several actresses very nearly ended up playing Bruce Wayne's love interest Vicki Vale before Kim Basinger was cast, including Blade Runner's Sean Young, who had to quit the part when she broke her collarbone during pre-production. Michelle Pfeiffer was also asked to audition for the role, though Keaton suggested it might have been an awkward fit, seeing as she and Keaton were dating at the time. The production went on with Kim, and then, quite ironically, Pfeiffer ended up starring as Catwoman in Batman Returns. But by 1991, she and Keaton were no longer an item, because ex-lovers playing now lovers isn't awkward at all. Still, they were great together. Composer Danny Elfman expected to be fired. Though Danny Elfman had a number of movie scores under his belt before Burton hired him for Batman, including Burton's two prior movies, too many thought that he was just still that bloke from Oingo Boingo, and Elfman recently declared that nobody but Tim wanted me on the set. However, the mood changed completely when Burton encouraged Elfman to pay the now iconic theme for some of the members of the team, and it went down a treat, so much so that it won Elfman a Grammy. Batman's cowl had to be redesigned last minute. Given the elaborate nature of blockbuster movie productions, it's not uncommon for crafts folk to overlook small details, as was the case with the design of the Batmobile. After initially forgetting to include a door, which now resulted in the sliding door that we all know and love now, the designers also failed to take into account the added four inches of headroom required for Michael Keaton to fit into the cockpit, cowl, ears, and all. During the first screen test for the Batmobile, Batman's ears got caught on the door as it closed, and with the vehicle's seat already as low as it could possibly be, there was only one other option. Lower the ears. As a result, a new cowl cast was created quickly with shorter ears, allowing the Cape Crusader to enter and exit the vehicle with a bit more swagger the special significance of Vicky Vale's blonde hair. Now, some fans took umbrage with the fact that Vicky Vale was depicted in the movie as a blonde, given that she's largely appeared with red hair in the comics. However, Batman co-creator Bob Kane actually lauded the change because Vale was originally supposed to be a blonde in the comics, yet due to a printing error, she was turned into a redhead. Still though, I don't think that they could say that they ever planned this, right? the film ultimately took 10 years to make. Though Batman was shot in just three months, the period from rights being acquired to the film actually hitting cinemas spanned an entire decade. The rights to the film had originally been bought from DC in 1979, but couldn't be sold to Hollywood as originally intended as a light comedic Batman movie. They just didn't want it. Ooh, no, get it away. The project suffered through an incredibly protracted development as writers, directors, and actors came and went until the stars aligned and Burton finally came aboard for good. The end result speaks for itself, a landmark superhero film that, while imperfect, still helped set the mold that so many subsequent superhero movies have followed. Thank you, Batman. You're pretty top-notch. Rowan Atkinson was considered to play a penguin. Dustin Hoffman was actually the first choice to play the penguin, but he wasn't the only big name to be considered. Marlon Brando, John Candy, Bob Hoskins, Ralph Waite, Dean Martin, Dudley Moore, Alan Rickman, John Goodman, Phil Collins, Charles Grodin, Christopher Lee, Joe Pesci, Ray Liotta, Gabriel Byrne, Alex Rocco, and Christopher Lloyd were all eyed up at one point before Danny DeVito was cast. Thank God. I can take a breath. Believe it or not though, 
it is also understood that in between this lot, none other than Rowan Atkinson was considered for the role. Given how definitive DeVito was as Cobblepot, however, it would seem that the director made the right choice. And it's somehow difficult to envision Mr. Bean capturing the same repulsive sense of horror. Sean Young was desperate to play Catwoman. Have you ever really wanted something? Like really, really, really wanted something to the point where it occupies your every waking thought and you dream about it every single night when you close your eyes to go to sleep. Well, whatever it was that you wanted, you definitely didn't want it as much as Sean Young wanted to play Catwoman in Batman Returns. Young set her sights on the role of Selina Kyle in the sequel and was so determined to convince Burton to offer her the part that she handmade her own cat suit and appeared in character as Catwoman on the Joan Rivers show in an attempt to convince the director that she was the perfect casting call. Needless to say, it did not work. The Penguin's image was a top secret affair. Information on DeVito's character was deliberately kept tightly under wraps in the build up to the film's release. So much so that he wasn't allowed to actually discuss details of his character's appearance with anybody outside of the filming process. Warner Brothers even went as far as hiring a private investigator to try and hunt down the perpetrator when shots of DeVito in costume were leaked to the press. Burton's idea was to really ramp up the shock factor when the Penguin was finally unveiled on screen and with those nice nightmarish prosthetics and his deathly power, you'd have to say job well done here. In fact, security on set was so stringent during the entirety of the shoot that Kevin Costner, who was like the biggest star back in 1992, was even denied access when he turned up for a visit. Two-Face was written out of the script. Two-Face would eventually become a villain proper in Batman Forever, but the initial plan was to actually have Harvey Dent's famous duplicitous alter ego make his big screen debut several years earlier in Batman Returns turns after Billy D. Williams played Dent in Batman in 1989. In early drafts of the script, the character would have had a fairly central role and would have suffered his trademark disfigurement. Presumably, this would have set the wheels in motion for a third movie in which we would have seen Two-Face pitting his wits against Keaton's Batman in a major way. Alas, what might have been, but at least Tommy Lee Jones' version was memorable? Robin was also written out of the script. You know that phrase, all dressed up with nowhere to go? Well, it's bad enough when when someone bails on you at the last minute after you've gone to all the effort of ironing a fresh t-shirt, washing behind your ears, and shaving your ball off for a night on the town, but next time you're feeling a little glum because of your flaky mates, spare a thought for poor old Marlon Wayans. Not only was the scary movie star cast as Robin in Returns, he was so deeply involved in the production process that he was even measured up for a full body suit. The reason for Robin getting the eventual boot though? Too many characters apparently. Warner Brothers were concerned that they were introducing too many new characters at once once and decided to hold him back for a sequel, effectively paying Wayans off for doing no work. McDonald's were forced to scrap their Happy Meal tie-in with the film. Suffice to say, Batman Returns was pretty dark. The film was like an ice-cold glass of 100% concentrated Tim Burton fever dream juice, with its neo-gothic stylings and sizable dollops of downright weirdness. The director's style has always been a relatively divisive one, kind of like Marmite for your eyes, but the debate surrounding him was only intensified after he took on a character as beloved as Batman. The last place you might expect a commercial tie-in to pop up for Batman Returns would be in a McDonald's Happy Meal. I mean, the clue's kind of in the title, but that's exactly what happened. Alas, it wasn't meant to be though, as a wave of complaints from parents concerned about the movie's dark and violent tone forced the fast food giants to pull the plug on the partnership. We did a whole video on how this partnership also helped kill a third Burton Batman movie in general, so please check that out as well. Plug, 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 plug. The plot was meant to be completely different. As with an awful lot of big blockbusters, a lot of stuff was chopped and changed during the production process on Batman Returns. Originally, the plan was to have the Penguin team up with Catwoman as the dastardly duo went on a frantic treasure hunt in search of hidden riches buried somewhere deep in the heart of Gotham City. Think the Goonies, but with less lighthearted banter and a hell of a lot more spandex. Instead, of course, the scriptwriters decided on a plot that saw a nefarious business mogul back the Penguin's ludicrous bid for mayor, while Selina Kyle just sort of fitted about stealing scenes and throwing a cat-shaped spanner in the works for pretty much everyone. The narrative arc was actually inspired by two episodes of the original TV series back in the 60s, and the copious revisions made for a wonderfully inspired blockbuster that managed to tour the line between satire and terrifying farce brilliantly. Danny DeVito showed serious commitment to his part. Danny DeVito's portrayal of the Penguin is arguably one of the best performances of his entire career. The Mad Legend has 
pulled off some absolute crackers over the years, but few have been as unforgettable or delightfully nauseating as his depiction of Oswald Cobblepot. In fact, you could probably argue that DeVito never reached that same level of gag-inducing shock again until he emerged doused in Vaseline and gasping from a leather sofa as Frank Reynolds in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. But how did he hit such a home run in Batman Returns? I mean, who am I to surmise on the work of a genius, but it probably had something to do with the fact that he insisted on staying in character at all times, even in between ticks. And after spending two hours in the makeup chair at the crack of dawn every morning, you can't really blame him for milking it for all it was worth. DeVito also refused a body double. Danny DeVito also took his commitment above and beyond in other ways too. In the scene where the penguin is pelted with rotten food by a furious mob, about an hour and a half into the film, the actor refused a body double and instead opted to take a face full of all kinds of nasty stuff. And this wasn't the only food-related bit of trivia either. When Selena Kyle, Catwoman's non-sticky-fingered real-life persona, is knocked out cold at one point in the film, her unconscious body is surrounded by a gaggle of feline onlookers. In order to get the cats to actually approach Michelle Pfeiffer for the necessary shot though, filmmakers stuffed her suit full of tuna. I can only imagine how that must have smelt. Michael Keaton cut more than half of Batman's lines from the script. Batman has never been the most conversational of protagonists, often trading deep, meaningful interactions and impassioned monologues for baritone grunts, thousand-yard stares, and the odd uppercut to a goon's jaw. But even taking into consideration the usual monosyllabic tendencies of his character, Keaton still felt that the Dark Knight was being a tad on the chatty side, and cut roughly half of his lines from the script. To be fair to the actor, the decision worked, and helped to cultivate a more mysterious brooding image than we might have otherwise have been treated to. That being said though, there's every chance that Mike was just trying to cut his workload down too. According to the man himself, he has never watched the film back and only took the gig because he needed the reported $10 million fee he was being paid to help close a real estate deal at the time. I mean, at least the dude's honest. Michelle Pfeiffer held a real bird in her mouth. One of the most iconic and arguably horrifying scenes in Batman Returns sees Catwoman take the Penguin's pet bird from its cage in his attic and then stuff it into a gob in an effort to gain leverage in their tense discussions. For a long time after the film's release, fans marveled at the set piece and pontificated on how Burton managed to achieve such a realistic rendering of the colourful little chap that Pfeiffer had seemingly just attempted to eat. Well, apparently with no hesitation or consideration of the risks, Pfeiffer had simply taken it in her hand and crammed it into her mouth. Even Burton, the creepmeister general that he is, was somewhat taken aback by the actress's moment of madness, saying afterwards, quote, I don't think I've ever been so impressed. She had a live bird in her mouth while the camera was rolling. It was four or five seconds, and then she let it fly out. It was before CG. It was before digital. It was so quick, it seems like it was an effect. The final shot cost $250,000. Given how much was chopped and changed during the filming process, it's perhaps unsurprising to learn that the original ending to Returns wasn't the one we actually got. In fact, it was only a matter of weeks before the film's cinema release that Warner Brothers decided they wanted to leave open the possibility of a Catwoman spin-off at some point in the future. What that meant for Returns, however, was a bit of a rejig, because up until the very final sequence in which we see Catwoman staring up at the bat signal, you'd be very much forgiven for thinking that the character was as dead as a doornail. Consequently, well after the rest of the movie had stopped filming, the studio had to hire a Pfeiffer body double and film an extra shot at the whopping expense of $250,000. A monkey attacked Danny DeVito's crown jewels on set. Monkeys love nuts, right? Well, apparently they love Danny DeVito's nuts in particular. Speaking on the Graham Norton show back in 2007, the actor revealed that he was accosted by a Simeon co-star during the filming of Returns. In the first first take of the scene where a monkey hands Cobblepot a note from Batman, the animal was so frightened by DeVito's appearance, I mean I can't blame it, that it panicked and then attacked his family jewels. Thankfully for him, the suit he was wearing was heavily padded in the crotch region. Jack Nicholson convinced DeVito to take the part. They say money talks, and nowhere is that more true than in Hollywood. Even Danny DeVito, a vocal socialist and all-around stand-up guy, can have his head turned by a fat wedge of the green stuff, or so it seems. The story goes that the actor was convinced to take on the role of Oswald Cobblepot by close friend Jack Nicholson after the double Oscar winner reminded him of just how much Wonga he pocketed for his iconic portrayal of the Joker in Burton's 1989 original. Presumably, he did not mention the possibility of genital maulings by monkeys. Keaton demanded a zipper for his batsuit. 
After suffering through the teething problems of the original movie, Michael Keaton felt that some alterations were necessary for the second flick, and insisted on having a zipper fitted to his batsuit the second time around. After all, I mean, even superheroes have to pee sometimes. Also, it might look like Michael Keaton's wearing some good old fashioned leather boots in his nifty batsuit, but the reality was that the Caped Crusader was in fact stalking around Gotham in a pair of Nike Air Jordan 6s. The trainers were then strapped to an artificial upper to give them a boot like feeling. Fans went on promotional poster stealing sprees. People evidently loved Michelle Pfeiffer's jaw dropping look in the film to the extent that Warner Brothers had to constantly dish out new promotional posters bearing her image no less to various cities across America in the run up to the film's release. Several of the advertisements, many hung in plexiglass at bus stops, were being stolen. And it got so bad that police officers had to patrol certain areas to prevent the perpetrators from striking again. How very Gotham City-esque. They say that crime doesn't pair, of course, but in this case, it might just have, because those prints have been known to fetch a pretty penny these days. Michelle Pfeiffer couldn't hear herself in that cat suit. Michael Keaton wasn't the only one to have issues with his costume, and poor Michelle Pfeiffer pretty much had to be poured into the latex bodysuit that she made so iconic in her portrayal of Catwoman, and seemingly, it might have been a little too skin tight. In fact, the outfit was so constricting that the actress had difficulty hearing her own voice while filming lines to the point that Burton had to tell her to speak in a lower register because she was shouting over everyone else in her scenes. Pfeiffer went through 60 different catsuits. It wasn't just sizing that was a problem for Michelle Pfeiffer though. Word on the street is that she went through a grand total of 60 catsuits over the duration of the entire shoot. Ordinarily, you might chalk that one up to shoddy needlework from the costuming department, but at $1,000 a shot, you'd be hoping for something a little more, I don't know, durable, maybe? DeVito read about him getting the role a full year before he was actually offered it. Interestingly, Danny DeVito actually read in a newspaper that he was being considered for the part of the Penguin a whole year before he was actually offered the role. Could it be some kind of spookily accurate premonition on the part of the print media, perhaps employing some kind of divination and ritualistic black magic to infer substantial truths about the distant future, or were they just chucking enough crap at the wall in the hope that some of it might actually stick and make it look as though they knew what they were talking about? Surely it wouldn't be the latter, would it? The film led to a spike in the population of King Penguins. Speaking of of daddy penguins, it would appear that the film had a fair bit to do with a spike in the population of the monochrome flightless birds in the English countryside. Wait, let me explain. The production desperately wanted to use real king penguins for the shoot, but the only tame specimens in captivity were at a bird sanctuary in the Cotswolds. Undeterred, however, Burton had the birds flown over to America in the specially refrigerated hold of a cargo plane. The luxury didn't stop there, though. The feathered superstars were given their own refrigerated trailer, their own swimming pool with half a ton of fresh ice replenished every day and had a smorgasbord of fresh fish delivered daily directly from the docks. The set was kept suitably chilly for the birds as well and they even had their own around-the-clock bodyguard presumably to scare off Kevin Costner.